It's a great pleasure for me now to invite UBC alumna, Julian Goldsmith, to join me on the stage for a conversation reflecting her experience at UBC and over the course of her career. June graduated from UBC with a Bachelor of Arts in Music in the class of 1955. That's 62 years ago. But you'll see that she's a very, very young and spry and incredibly energetic uh, young woman. Her career in music has been as an educated, educator pardon me, and empresario. In 1986, she founded the Music in the Morning concert series, a unique and uniquely successful concert concept and the series is still running vigorously today, 31 years later. Her contributions to musical life have been recognized by membership in the Order of Canada and the Order of BC, and a UBC Music Scholarship has been endowed in her honor by friends and supporters of music in the morning. If anyone can tell you the secret to a successful life in music, it's June Goldsmith. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Yes. Well, I, I guess I am spry if I can do that. <laughs> Jude, I want to begin by, um, by evoking for students a sense of history to understand the roots of our sense of community. We talk about oral tradition in music. It's, there's also an oral tradition in this school. We, it's been handed down over the generations, and we, we're maybe it's, uh, only subliminally aware of it, but it's, it's very important. Uh, Judy graduated in 1955. UBC has changed a lot since then. Uh, our music building seems kind of well-worn to us, but it uh, didn't even open until 1968, uh, 12 years after you graduated. What was the campus like when you were a student, and what were professors and students like? Well, I don't think any but thing is, well, the physical uh, idea of the campus has changed a lot. I was at the era when you had all those army huts, and we had to walk between all these army huts to get to our next class. It's so with the rain and so on, everybody was all wet. and. In the winter, it was so cold. Um, but there were only 5,000 students, and to get into UBC, just as a little change, if you had your university graduation uh, in high school, you either went the technical way or you had your university, gradu university uh, degree um, or graduation, uh, you passed those exams. You would just turn up here and register. There was no, not, you didn't have any exams to pass. You didn't have to show your grades is that you had this high school and you registered and you got into your classes and there you went. And so it was, it was very um, easy, as we say, but uh, you know, I was very inspired here. I had some wonderful Dr. Sauer, uh, I think with the uh, history professor and the Adaskins, of course, were doing their music, but there was no music building. But I was here the night that they had the opening of this building. And I, it was so filled, every stair was filled with people, and people were sitting in the front and on the stage here. And there was such a spirit of, well, we did it all together. It was amazing. I'll never forget that. It was very, very uh, uplifting because there were a lot of people that made this happen, visionaries who saw that, yes, we do need music. We, you know, let's, let's spend some money building a hall. And a, and a facility for, for people who want to spend their life in music. But that evening was wonderful because the people who funded this, the university people who saw that this is where the university direction can go, was really celebrated. And it was, in a, it, although it was hugely packed here, it seemed an intimate thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud to be an alum of, uh, of uh, UBC. June, you started the uh, Music in the Morning concert series in 1986, uh, but what did you do before that? That was uh, in the middle of your career, so to speak. How did, how did you get to the stage of becoming an empresario? You probably didn't plan to do it uh, when you graduated. How did that happen? Uh, not at all. I, I was going to, I took a master's in music at Stanford, and I came back here, got married, and had a family, and I was a stay-at-home mom. Didn't do any music for about six years, and then when my um, uh, before I was married, I just jumped ahead. Before I was married, I taught high school. After I graduated uh, from university and took a teacher's diploma, I, I started teaching in the Vancouver High School, John Oliver and Killarney High School. And I remember particularly at Killarney, 
I had a grade eight boys class of music, 38 boys. You know, I always wonder that I survived that year still loving music. I used to stand there and they'd walk up the stairs, we were on the second floor, and they had just had P.E. In those days, they, sell, they, they separated the classes. The, the girls were at, I think, home ec or something, and the boys were at music. Well, I could hear them coming upstairs with their feet, and you know, they, were, they weren't particularly smelling sweet because they just had P.E. And they would walk into the classroom, and I remember thinking, I prepared for those classes like you wouldn't believe. I had, I think, 15 options. This didn't work, go to B. It didn't work, go to C. Go to E. Go to F. And, but you know, by the end of the year, we got to like each other. And I really look on that as my first experience with an audience. What can you give your audience? I mean, what? This is an exaggeration because they wouldn't take much, believe me. But I had them clapping, I had them listening to things, I had them, I, I can't even remember it, but all I remember is, is that I still love music. So after my youngest boy was in grade one, I thought, oh, I guess I better get going and doing something. So it just happened that UBC at that time needed a, a lecturer in music appreciation in their they called it a continuing education program, an adult day, daytime program. And so they called me and said, would you consider teaching classes in music appreciation? And I said, oh, I'd love to do that in about a year. And she said, why? Why a year? We're looking for somebody in September. And I said, oh, well, I haven't touched the piano for years now, six years or so. I, I think I forget how to play and da 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 da. And she said, well, now, June, if you were to start, you know, in September, and this was in June, she said, what would you start with? And apparently, I never missed a beat. And I said, well, I'd start with Chopin. You know, he was so pianistic. He lived in Poland, came out and da 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 She interrupted me, and she said, we'll start September the 15th. <laughs> You're ready. So that was a great course, and I taught out here for about eight years, and then I decided that I... I wouldn't do that, I'd take a break. And so I, a number of my students, we had young women in their 40s in those days because they weren't working, uh, phoned me and said, could we do a class at your home? So I said, sure. So they came to my home, my living room held about 20 people. So I got the idea then of concerts, you know, just kind of like that. And then I would play every, at every class I played or I brought in a professional musician, a solo artist, and all of a sudden, I got this idea. I will start a series myself. It will be one hour long. It will be 10.30 in the morning. The artists will talk about what they're going to play. There'll be no written program notes, because I want to know what their personality is like. I want to know how they can connect with the audience. There'll be flowers on the stage. There'll be coffee beforehand from 10 to 10.30. And I'll just start this. And I went away and I thought, uh, okay, you know what do you think I should do first? So I called Linda Lee Thomas, who at this time had a trio, masterpiece trio, and I said, you know, I'm gonna start a series on a Wednesday morning at 10.30. Would your trio play? And luckily she said, oh, we'd love to. So I took a breath and I thought, okay, well, I'll find six people that will play. I had, I had not before ever presented anything. I hadn't really realized what I was, that I was starting a business. I mean, budgets and, and negotiating artist fees, things like that. I had no idea, but I just did it and I learned on the job. And that's how it started, really. And the first season was so successful that by the end of it, I had got a board of directors. We'd signed up as a, as a nonprofit society. I had planned the second year, and I was thinking down the line. And I just learned all this by doing it. And, you know, I guess I took a lot of risks. I mean, I remember the first negotiation I did with an out-of-town agent. 
that was for Maureen Forrester, and I call, I had their number, but I sat by the phone for a day because I was so nervous to call. Did I have the right number? Was I offering enough? And I had the date, and I had, so I called up the agent, and this guy answered the phone, and he said, Bill Capone here. <laughs> I thought I'd reach the mafia. I just, I just thought, oh my word, this is some. So anyway, I negotiated, and uh, I, so the next one wasn't as hard, and on and on it went. And I think my love of what I was doing, and uh, well, I think I'm skipping ahead here, Richard. I did just get so excited talking about it. Well, uh, what was, it, what has been the um, crucial thing for you in in selecting artists? In terms of their ability to communicate, what what do you want them to um, embody when they communicate uh, to your audience? I want them to embody it first of all what they can do. They've got to know the notes. Uh, secondly, I'd like them to communicate their feeling of the music. You know, we get so involved in getting the right notes and the speed and. I can play it fast and fast and fast, and maybe you don't need to play it that fast. I'm more interested, can you communicate how you feel about this piece? If you don't like the piece, we're going to know that, you know, <laughs> and, oh, it's on the list, I've got to do this, you know? No, you have to like, and of course, now that you're graduating, you can do as you like, right, Richard? You don't have to play. Uh, this is so exciting for you today because not only are you graduating from, but you're graduating into a whole life of freedom where you can decide what you'd like to do in music. There's just plenty out there, but you choose and you figure out. So it's a challenge, but also a great opportunity that you're in music, you're in something you love, at least I hope you do, and when you perform, you somehow just uh, present that over the, flood, the floodlights here. You just sort of, the audience, and you sit in an audience and you hear a concert. I want to feel secure that you do know what you're doing. <laughs> and that when you start off on this, say, Brahms, uh, Jackie knows how he's going to end the piece. I mean, there's such an arc in your playing and in your music that I want you to know where you're going. And you can hear that. Even people who aren't in music, he, they, you feel that path. So I guess to answer your question is I want you to feel secure. I want you to feel that you're loving what you're doing. When you walk out, I want you to walk out with, wow, am I lucky I can do this. And you may be so nervous that you just think, how can I do this? But you know, experience, you'll get it. And if you love it, then all that sort of stuff just goes. And then your audience, uh, I was just reading about Rachmaninoff, the great, great, one of the great pianists of the world. Uh, he said the most precious thing about being a performer to him was connecting with the audience. And he, he said he could not go into a recording studio and, and play he would, because he wouldn't have this connection he needed that when he sat down at the keyboard. And he doesn't exactly say how he connects, but I suspect it was his personality to begin before he played, and then as he started to play, he connected. I've asked through my 25 years of being artistic director, probably everybody who has come to play for music in the morning, how much time does it take for the performer to know uh, that he has connected with the audience. The performers tell me minutes, just minutes. They know whether they're, whether you're with them. Are you, so what can we do, what can we learn and enjoy today? Or are we, show me, I hear you good. <laughs> it's what can we all have as a music experience together? And the audience knows because the performer just has a very nice way of approaching his music that is, wow, this is great. I think you described, <clears throat> pardon me, um, that, that there's freedom involved, that you get to choose the things you love to do. 
I think this is a really important thing for everybody to remember. You're used to us telling us what, to do, what you should be doing here in school. We've been giving you requirements. But as you, as you graduate, now you're going to be able to make your own choices. And um, it takes time before you know which choices are the ones that really belong to you, right? I, mean, I was 50 years old when I started music in the morning. Yeah. <clears throat> so it didn't come right away. I mean, I, got, I started at 50 at my main career. I mean, I'm in broadcasting now. I have a radio show and I'm doing other things. I won't say it's my last career, but it was my major career. <laughs> uh, I think it's very important for all of you to start thinking about this now that you're, you're moving into a time of liberation. It's a, it's a little, uh, maybe a little scary because it's sort of high altitude, but uh, on the other hand, y you will now find your own way and you can be receptive to the things that you want to do. I think that's the most important element about this, this particular moment. Well, it really is, and take risks. So just do things. I, I, I'm going to tell you this really funny story because you never know where music is going to take you. We were invited oh, 10 years ago to a very prestigious wedding at the big church on Shaughnessy Anglican Church on Granville Street. And it was a big affair. Six bridesmaids, I don't know, four flower girls. Just her dress was just enormous with the train. So I said to my husband, I think I'd like to get there early because I want to hear the organist because he's going to be playing all sorts of wonderful music in this 500 people. So we get there and it's quiet. And I said to my husband, gee, he's not here. I, I'm really surprised he's not sharing his all, you know, his pedals and his pumps and everything in the organ. And finally at 7 o'clock when the wedding was supposed to start, about 5 past 7, the minister came to the front of the church and said, I'm sorry to tell you, but the, you know, we can't start yet, but the bride and groom are here, so don't worry about that. So, still silence, there's nothing. And then about five minutes later, the minister comes to the edge of the pew and he says to me, this is Goldsmith, I understand you know how to play the piano. <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, the bride needs some music to come down the aisle with, she can't walk down to silence, and I thought, oh dear, and I said, well, and he said, and the organ's locked, and I thought, oh, hallelujah, thank God. <laughs> anyway, I said, he said, would you play the piano if we move the piano to the front where the aisle is? And I said, well, and then I looked at the back where the bride was, and I thought, oh, how can I say no? So I said, could you give me some music? I'm good at sight reading, but I'm not good at, I didn't have anything memorized for wedding music, believe me. And so, anyway, he said, well, it's locked in the organ, too. But he said, I can give you the hymnal. So I took a hold of the hymnal, and I went and sat down. The piano had been moved out. So I started looking through the hymnal, and it was, I was brought up a Lutheran, so there was Bach on every second page, and I thought, oh, I'll be fine. But I didn't know this hymnal, and so I somehow got to the Easter section, and it was like uh, Christ died for our sins, and in dark Gethsemane, and I thought, oh man, what am I going to do? Anyway, the minister says, we will now begin, Mrs. Goldsmith. So I don't improvise. I have never had improvised. I improvised on dark Gethsemane. You would never know. It was, I did up the keyboard, down the keyboard, flourishes, trills. Oh, man, I tell you, my son said to me, I guess they were very happy they invited you to the wedding. <laughs> Bravo, June. Thank you. Thank you for uh, being here today, for sharing uh, your advice, uh, for giving advice. There was a lot of advice in there to the graduating students and for uh, just showing how refreshing uh, a life of music can be for everyone here. Thank you, June. You're very welcome.